We pause to appreciate. We pray that we will always be drawn more and more to gratitude toward you. We thank you for the blessing of this day and now for the blessing of this assembly. Thank you for each family who's here, each person who's here, each soul who's here. We pray that you will help us to enrich our souls, to feed our souls through worship and through singing, through praying, through reading, through studying. Help us also to build and lift up one another through our conversations that, that lift us closer to you. We do pray for those families, those individuals we've mentioned here tonight that need you. Help us also to show them the love that you would have us to. Help those that perhaps we've not mentioned publicly but we know about. Help us to also continue to pray for them and to love them out of your love. We thank you for the blessing of faith and trust. Help us to trust you more and more each day through the certainty of your promises and the certainty of your word. Bless us this night to do all things to your glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Classes are now dismissed. I printed it off. I was going to release you of that, that burden. It was literally the first thing I did after y'all left. Okay, Daniel chapter 12. We're going to try to dive in as quickly as we can just to give ourselves the chance to cover as much as we can. That said, we want to cover it in a way that's understanding, it's helpful. Okay, to set up chapter 12, we need to remember this is still a part of the whole section that goes back to chapter 10. Chapter 10 introduces the vision, especially by way of this messenger that appears to Daniel. And you've got this kind of pulling back the curtain, as we called it, about angels and their role in things that we, we still don't know all about. But we know they have a role. They are messengers sent to serve uh, in God's purposes. He says he's come to Daniel. Despite all he's gone through with the, the princes of Persia, he's come to Daniel, verse 14, to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. The vision is for days yet to come. That's 10, verse 14. And without that verse, the world has made any number of egregious errors about chapters 11 and 12. It's about your people spoken to Daniel, which is the Jews. And especially the Jews who would return to Jerusalem, to Judea, after Daniel dies. And this message is sealed up, as we're going to see in chapter 12. And it's going to be preserved so they would have it, could keep reading it, could verify it, could see the things unfolding, and still know God is going to preserve them. So it's going to come back to them. And as we go into chapter 12, we're going to keep coming back to this principle. That's the key to, to understanding whatever it is we can understand about these two chapters. All right, and we're, we're just going to go ahead and show our hand. We've mentioned this every week. But the final message that's communicated through all of this is that God's people always have hope. God's people always have hope. He's going to sustain us. He's going to sustain us through his promises and his strength. No matter how bad things seem, no matter how bad things are, we always have hope, and he always preserves us. So, let's quickly summarize chapter 11, especially as it points us to chapter 12. The Greeks end up conquering the Persians. Alexander the Great, the one responsible for that, dies pretty quickly. He dies at age 32. But through his efforts, the Greek culture spreads and continues to spread. It's a major development in world history called Hellenization. After he dies, his four generals take over sub-kingdoms. They split up the kingdom. And in this vision of chapter 11, there are only two kingdoms that are referenced. And it's because their lands overlap in the Holy Land, in Ju Judah, Judea, Jerusalem. All right? So because it's about your people, the Jews, 
These are the two kingdoms constantly fighting over that land. So the kings of the south, the, the Egyptians, kings of the north, are the Seleucids, and they're back and forth until Antiochus III, who is called Antiochus the Great, the Seleucid king from the north, he finally establishes dominant control. And Egypt is not the world power that it once was once he does that. So there's the map. Purple is Jerusalem. Seleucids, Ptolemies are constantly back and forth. It's just a recipe for constant conflict. And the Jews are right in the heart of it. Then, beginning of verse 21, you've got one that comes on the scene. This is chapter 11 still. Verse 21, you've got Antiochus IV, his son, and he comes to power not by traditional means. It's not automatic that he comes to power. There's a king in between, he and his father. But he does so through flattery, through manipulative means. He continues to expand his power, not as a mighty military general, but as one who's a manipulator, a flatterer. He gave himself the name Epiphanes, which means God manifest. And you remember the people flipped that around and called him Epimenes, which means madman, because he was just a loose cannon, could not be trusted by anybody. Now, the key part of the text is... 30, 30, verse 30 or so through 33. Okay? Verse 30, he suffers a defeat of sorts when he goes down to Egypt. The Romans step in and they come close to killing him, but they don't. He's embarrassed. While he's embarrassed, there's a revolt in the Holy Lands. And he thinks it's a revolt in that they're trying to kick him out. It's really just one of those high priests trying to get back his spot. And so he is utterly offended because he's been embarrassed. Now he's offended, and he takes all of this balled-up insecurity, number one, because he can't manage the kingdom. Number two, the Jews' unwillingness, some Jews at least, unwillingness to accept his bribes. You've got some who are holy. Those are the ones who do not violate the covenant in the text. Then you've got some Jews who won't accept the Greek culture. They refuse to be Hellenized because they think it... it conflicts with their faithfulness to God. So you've got all these levels of embarrassment and then he takes it personally when they do not do what he wants them to do and so he directly attacks them. On his way back home he just kills a bunch of them on the Sabbath day. He steals from the temple. He restricts their sacrifices. About 167 B.C. until he dies the Jews cannot offer sacrifices. He keeps them from circumcising their young boys. He will not allow them to have the text of Scripture. He can't, they can't do the things that identify them as Jews. And then he does really the unthinkable. Because he as a Gentile enters the temple. He enters the most holy place, which no ordinary Jew could do, no, quote, regular priest could do, only the high priest could do, and he could only do it one day a year. And this Gentile, foreigner, pagan, goes into the most holy place, on the altar, offers a pig. That's what's called the abomination of desolation. He blasphemes God directly. So the verses that follow that section, you've got him painted as, uh, you know, him anointing himself as a god. He doesn't even respect the Greek gods. He makes himself a god, re referencing that nickname he gives himself. And so he's at the height of arrogance. He's come down as hard against God's people really as anyone has before. Even harder than Nebuchadnezzar did. But he dies, and he dies alone. Verse 45. That gets us through the end of chapter 11. And we mentioned this last week, but just, just remember, God's people are never promised to be free from persecution. But God always promises to sustain us through it. And it's through suffering that we will be strengthened. And sometimes, maybe oftentimes, that most intense and most strengthening type of suffering is when we suffer directly because of our faith. All right, so let's read some in chapter 12. Someone on my right, my right-hand side, the north side of the auditorium, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Chapter 12.
okay? Yeah, the three is good. All right, so this is really finishing out the vision. Verse 4 is still a part of the communicating of the vision. But just quickly notice what happens. The chief angel we talked about a little bit in chapter 10. Remember this messenger comes to Daniel and he says, I was in this struggle until Michael came and helped. Well now, verse 45, Antiochus dies. Michael arises, verse 1, he's the chief angel. And he even says here, the great prince who has charge of your people. And we talked about that several weeks ago. To some degree, it appears as though Michael is the angel, quote, assigned to the Jews. All right, that makes some sense with text in the book of Jude. Then there's this time of trouble, and I think this key phrase is such as never has been seen before. So an intense time of trouble. Now just notice, I would throw this part in there. It doesn't say who the trouble is for. Most people who comment about this assume that it's about the faithful. But the text doesn't say that. It's just a time of trouble. Okay? And then there is a resurrection, clearly verse 2. But we don't know from the text itself which resurrection. Then you see verse 3, the lasting effects of that resurrection, whatever it is. Verse 3, the white shall be like brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. So there's... Faithfulness, faithfulness that is public, that is clear. There's a clear separation of the faithful and the wicked. All right, now, someone in the middle section, read for us verse 4. Okay, so what's the instructions to Daniel? Seal it up, shut up the words, and seal the book. Meaning, preserve it, all right? Because it's not going to happen soon. It's going to happen sometime in the distance. That's a different take on what is said in Revelation. Revelation said that things are soon to happen, quickly to happen. Here, he says, you need to seal it up for your people so they will have it. And the implication is so they can hold on to it as they unfold and until they unfold, okay? There will also be a time of increasing knowledge or increased activity. Now, the important thing to notice here, just in quick summary overview before we get into interpretation stuff, is notice now the vision is itself over. It's as if what the messenger intended to say is now all out there. It's all completed. He's told the vision. He's told Daniel what to do. Preserve it. Seal it up. Now, beginning of verse 5, we're going to see, because the vision's over, we're going to see two questions. And I think that's an important distinction because sometimes people will look at the answers to these questions and they'll say, well, these answers can't really be about stuff that's already covered because they come later than the vision. But the way I'm reading it, it makes perfect sense that they are about the vision because they're asked about the vision. He gives the vision, and then you've got two other figures, two other men, it says, and they're talking about it. They're on the bank of the river, and one of them asks, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Pointing back, these wonders, the vision. So the first question is about the vision. Okay, and the answer, short answer is a time, times, which would be two, and a half a time. So that's three and a half, which means it's perfectly imperfect. Okay, it's, it's not complete. It's evil, perhaps, even. The second question is Daniel's question. Daniel doesn't ask when. Daniel asks, what shall be the outcome of these things? It's, it's almost like he's overwhelmed, and we saw that in chapter 10. It kept over, keeps overwhelming him. It's almost as if Daniel's asking, okay, what do you need me to do with this? I'll seal it up. I'll preserve it. But, but just give me the short version again so that I'll know what I need to do. Tell me what it means to me, kind of thinking. What's the outcome of these things? Again, these things, pointing back to the vision. So some people will take those numbers that's at the end in verse 12, and will say, well, those aren't about the vision. Those are about something else. Well, he's asking about these things. That makes me think it's about the vision itself. All right? Now, one, one thing to just notice. I love how simple this wisdom is. But think of how hard it is for us 
to put this into practice daily. Daniel says, what's the outcome? What, what do I need to, to really know and do because of this? He says, you go your way. Many will purify themselves. Many will obey. Many will remain faithful. The wicked will do what? They'll act wickedly. And then he says again, you go your way till the end. So just pause and think about how helpful that wisdom can be in a lot of the, the concerns that we have. Maybe on a political level with governments. Maybe with wondering about the future. You go your way. Meaning you stay faithful in the way that you know the scriptures teach. Daniel has led a life of faithfulness. Daniel, you stay faithful as you have been. You keep living the life you know the Lord wants you to live. Those who obey will obey. Those who are wicked will remain wicked. But you go your way. Okay? We see how simple that is? You focus on what you can control, which is your faithfulness. Knowing there will be some who obey, some who don't. So you, you remain faithful. You go your way. Not choosing your own way, but following the way of the Lord. And then he does give a promise of 1,290 days, and then another one of 1,335, which is 1,290 plus 45. And there's all sorts of speculation about what that is, um, none of which is all that clear and convincing. But just worth noting, that's the summary of the whole chapter. All right, who wants, to, who wants to tell us what all that means? If we've summarized the whole chapter, who wants to, who wants to summarize and tell us everything? Uh, clearly, I'm kidding, okay? Let's start with this. What's the main idea? What's the main point? If we go back to when the vision starts, 11 verse 2, the vision concludes in 12 verse 4, we need to see the big picture before we can ever have much success with the details. Okay, that's true here. That's true in Revelation. That's true with parables. It's true with so many sections of Scripture. We must know the big picture before we can let the details speak. So God is faithful. God will preserve his faithful children. That's the blessing of hope that he gives. God's faithful, therefore he's going to preserve his faithful people. The promise is, 12 verse 1, your people shall be delivered. Who is the vision about? 10 and verse 14, what is to happen to your people? Well, 12 verse 1 answers that. Your people shall be delivered. And then he says, blessed are those who wait, even at the end of this, in verse 12. Blessed are those who wait on the 1335. So there's a blessing that comes by waiting because God is faithful and thus helps his people be faithful. All right, questions through summary of chapter 12 and what is the main point. If any interpretation we take moving forward changes that main point, then we've got issues, right? Okay, anybody have any quick guesses? I mean, tell us about chapter 12. Who's it talking about? What's it talking about? Any, anybody done any study before about this? Recall anything? I've got plenty we can talk about. I'm not... I'm not low on material, but I just want to give you the opportunity if you've if you're processing this stuff, just to, to chime in. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. And the phrase of, um, was it chapter 9? And the phrase here again is the time of the end. Not the end of all time, but the time of the end. The end of what? 10 and verse 14, your people. So a completion, a coming to an end, yeah, I think that's, that's crucial. That's key. All right, let's go through some possibilities, all right? Two things to just guide us on the front end. However someone chooses to interpret the last six verses of chapter 11 impact how you interpret chapter 12. Okay? I believe somewhat certainly, somewhat strongly. I, I'm not saying that I'm right. I'll give room to somebody who, who believes otherwise. But I think 40 through 45 are still about Antiochus the fourth. I think the one who dies in verse 45 is still Antiochus. Multiple brethren that I've read would argue it's 
Romans, okay? So for the most part, you've got the Antiochus view or you've got the Roman view. It's a Caesar or a combination of Caesars once Rome takes over. So how you interpret that impacts then how you interpret chapter 12. Because if you think that's Antiochus, then that gives you, you know, a few hundred more years to work with in chapter 12. If you believe it's the Romans, then that pushes the timeline even later for chapter 12. We need to be clear that verses 40 through 45 are not at all about the end times. They're about either Antiochus or the Romans. No vision um, talks about a kingdom beyond the Roman kingdom, except for the kingdom of God, obviously, throughout all of Daniel. All right? So that would limit us on that. Just know that verses 40 through 45 are not about the end times. But some suggest 12 verse 2 is the final resurrection. So the faithful are resurrected, the unfaithful are resurrected to eternal shame. They would argue that's the final resurrection. All right? So I can, I can admit that that's a possibility. Wayne Jackson believes verse 2 is the final resurrection. I don't believe it is. Uh, and that's really weird to say I don't believe what the Jackson believes about it because he's thought about it uh, way more than I have and studied it. But it's a possibility. All right. So the four, as best I can summarize it, four main possibilities. You've got verses 40 through 45 of 11 being about Antiochus. And then the first three verses of chapter 12 continue that same timeline in a historical way. That's the most straightforward way. Okay, we need to be clear. That's, if you're just reading it as history, that would be most straightforward. That would be how the Jews survived his persecution. And so verses 1 through 3 would describe those silent years before Christ came. So they were delivered from the hand of Antiochus. And they're alive. They're around. They are a nation, a people for when Jesus comes. All right? So just straightforward, you almost kind of keep reading. And verse 3, verse 2, we're still talking about Jews pre-Jesus, pre-John the Baptist. So whatever resurrection you might ascribe to that, whatever, you know, those who are wise and those who teach others to learn, it's basically purely historical. That's one option. And it's the most straightforward option. All right, letter B. Again, takes the view that Verses 40 through 45 are Antiochus, but then when you get to chapter 12, it says that verses 1 through 3 are more of a spiritual discussion, okay? I'm calling it a dispensational view, but don't confuse that with dispensational premillennialism. That's something totally different, meaning this means that once they are delivered, that's coinciding with the new covenant, the dispensation of Christ. Okay, so Ryan said, it sounds like there is a completion. There is an end. What's it the end of? It's the end of the Mosaic dispensation. It's the beginning of the Christian dispensation, the time of the church, the time of Christ. And so chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, would describe that. The resurrection would not be the final resurrection, but would be more akin to salvation. Okay? And it might be a little bit of a stretch to do it through prophecy, but clearly we know of the connection between baptism and resurrection. I mean, it's it's um, intended to be that way. It's God's design that it's that way. And what this means is God preserved his people not only for Jesus to come through them, but then also to save them, which means he preserved them till the time of the end. So those are two views using the Antiochus view of the end of chapter 11. A prominent view. Many you know, brethren, even conservative brethren, would take the view of letter C, which is that verses 40 through 45 of chapter 11 represent Roman Caesars. And then you get to chapter 12, 1 through 3, and that represents the events that happen at the end of the time of the temple. So you've got Pentecost happening in between the end of verse 45 and chapter 12. Romans have taken over. People will start becoming Christians. The Christian dispensation is here. And then the trouble amps up in Jerusalem through the Romans, and in AD 70, they persecute the Jews, they destroy Jerusalem. That's a pretty prominent view. Um, a lot of people that I would trust would take that view. And chapter, I, I mean, just to throw that in there quickly about why this could be the view, uh, chapter 9 talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and uh, the impact of the Romans destroying the temple. So, I mean, th there's some reason to say, okay, maybe this is it. 
But then you've also got a blending of the previous three. You've got Antiochus being viewed as AD, or excuse me, as 40 through 45, and then 12, 1 through 3 is the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So you've got the changeover to the Romans that are, it's not mentioned. Uh, you've got the Christian dispensation beginning, it's not mentioned. But you've got the Jews being per, uh, persecuted and then destroyed in AD 70. I mentioned Brother Jackson. He, he takes one that I didn't even put up here, but he, he argues 40 through 45 are still in Tychus. Uh, he's really kind of his stuff's one of the main reasons I, I lean toward that view. Uh, but then he takes this kind of big picture, end of time kind of perspective toward chapter 12. It's just wrapping up the whole thing. Um, and again, I, I trust him on a lot of things and uh, can see some of the reasons he gets to that. All right, how thoroughly are we confused at this stage? So it, this is how, you know, Bible study gets cumulative. And, and you got to look forward, you got to look back, you got to get some parameters in place first, and you got to keep chewing, you got to sleep on it, okay? Jokingly, somewhat jokingly, but, but when I tell you which one of the four I lean toward, I, I've kind of thought about it like, well, this is, this is the view that I've kept for two or three days in a row, so maybe that's the one I lean toward the most, right? Like there's a, a kind of a back and forth, well, maybe that, that works best, or maybe this works best. It's just because there are some details that are ambiguous enough, and we just don't know for sure, and then you pull in some of these references to New Testament texts, it really begins... To give us options, okay? Because there's no doubt, all right, no doubt that Matthew 24, when Jesus warns Christians about the destruction of Jerusalem, or soon to be, you know, they would be Christians. They're Jews at the time, but because they would listen to him, they would be Christians in 70. He's warning them about the destruction of Jerusalem. He uses this language. I think that's a, a means to intensify for them and to say this is how big a deal this is. I don't think. The language means the prophecy is about the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, what questions do you have now? Just a summary of the positions. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 I, I, absolutely. In some ways, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, absolutely. I do think that's a, a, an amazing and a very necessary takeaway. Yeah. And, and I would argue that's why Revelation pulls on so many of these themes. I don't think it's intentionally repeating them because they are the same thing. I think he's tapping into that same urgency and same cyclical nature of history to say, hey, you remember this, these times? Remember what happened? Remember what God did? He's the same God. And, and really things are better because of Christ. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That's Romans 15, verse 4. Things written before time were written for our learning. Will we learn not just the scriptures, not just the facts, but will we learn what God did, what God preserved? That's, that's the thing we can learn. And right, and so that means, to, to that point, Miss Debbie, if we'll just learn that God's people are preserved, that relieves the pressure of us having to know exactly who verses 40 through 45 are about, or exactly who 12, 1, and 3 are about. We can kind of give each other some flexibility on some of those, as long as they're not consequential, because we know the end takeaway is God will preserve his people. So he's going to preserve us just like he preserved them. Are right, anybody able to kind of digest those? And is there one that stuck out, stuck, stuck out to you? Um, as we read over them, hey, that, that might fit a little bit better. Well, that's, that's a major question, yeah. Well, if you, if you take, if you pretend it's, or if you believe the Romans are at the end of 11, 
you probably don't view it as him at all. Like you think it's Matthew 24, 80, 70. Um, I think it's Antiochus view, but it, it, again, you know, there's decisions we have to make that then impact other decisions. And then you've got this 45 day difference between the two, right? And I appreciate you mentioning the word warning, okay? For me, that's one of the things that, that leads me to kind of to lean the direction I lean. If I had to give an answer right now tonight, I would say it's, it's letter B, all right? And, you know, sometimes we're going to get um, poked at for being too dispensational. But, you know, I, I read the New Testament, it's clear, um, it's clear God has been pointing toward this era, these last days. Last days that began in AD 33, as the era he's been pointing toward. The era of the church, the Christian dispensation, is what God intended to unfold through the fullness of time. And so I don't think we can be too dispensational or too church-oriented. And um, so I lean toward chapter 12, 1 through 3 being more or less a spiritual fulfillment. All right? So almost envisioning you know, the changeover that happens at Pentecost. All right? Now, here's a quick summary of why I've come to that. Uh, number one, I think it fulfills 10 verse 14. It's about the Jews, right? They were delivered, verse 1. Delivered what? Delivered over to the time that they could receive salvation. God preserved them as a nation until Jesus came, until Jesus died, and then they had the opportunity to hear and be saved. Uh, take that a, letter A view where it's just constantly about the Jews before Jesus. It's really anticlimactic because we, we don't have any inspired scripture about what happens in the 400 years after Malachi and before Jesus. We have plenty of history, but it's not inspired. And so we're just, it, it kind of almost leaves it as a whimper that, okay, there's this resurrection, there's this enlightening that happens, and, and that's just about Jewish history, and we, you know, we don't have that preserved. That seems a little odd. What I really kind of believe makes the case is number two and three in that it honors the rest of the book of Daniel. All right? Think of how multiple visions end. Chapter 2, verse 44. You've got the four kingdoms in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, and you've got this stone that comes in in the days of the last kingdom, and it's in the days of the, those kings that God will set up his kingdom. It'll be established. It'll never be destroyed. What did that kingdom do to the other four kingdoms? Destroyed them, right? So in the days of the Roman kings, God will set up his kingdom, the church, and in that vision, the stone destroyed all the other kingdoms, right? It's the church being established. It's also a judgment toward all the other kingdoms of man. You get to chapter 7, another vision that points to the kingdom of God and a kingdom of God that will last forever. It'll be one that has all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. It's about the church. And it's also a judgment against the other nations. Chapter 9 specifically speaks about Jesus. And listen to the terms it uses. Chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. The work of Jesus that would have led right up to Pentecost, it finishes the vision in chapter 9, which was about your people and your holy city. So there's already been this pattern established throughout Daniel, I would argue. Then you do some searching of the phrase trouble or distress, that's never been seen before, which is interesting. That phrase is used multiple times in Scripture. Okay? A lot of times it's about like the Egyptians had never seen before. Here it's about that nation has never seen before. Okay? Best I can tell, I could not find a time when that was used 
toward the faithful. But instead, it's more of a judgment against the people who are rejecting God. And that might be debatable. You get to Matthew 24, uh, time and revelation. But it's a statement of judgment. Why has it never been seen before? Because of who's carrying it out. Pharaoh's seen major destruction because he's Pharaoh. But he's never seen destruction like the plagues because God's the one bringing it upon him. So I tend to think, 12 verse 1, the trouble is against the Jews who reject Jesus, reject God, more than it is about the faithful. See, it's about the Jews, but not the Jews who are faithful. It's about the Jews that reject God and reject Jesus. you got two significant prophecies in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31 and Joel 2. Both are quoted at length in the New Testament. Okay, Jeremiah 31 quoted in Hebrews 8 and in length in chapter 8 and then shorter version in chapter 10 of Hebrews. Joel 2, this section of Joel 2, quoted by Peter at length at Pentecost, Acts 2. Both of them are about the promise of the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, and about the day of the Lord. Those who call upon him will be saved. Holy Spirit will come, out, come upon you. That's Joel 2. Both of those also contain promises, what Ryan would say, of warning, of judgment. And Peter even quotes that section at Acts 2. So what happened at Acts 2 that would seem to be a direct fulfillment physically of this stuff? Um, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. Before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. You know, there's, there's some things that I'm not, I don't know exactly the pinpoint answer to those prophecies. But that day was a fulfillment of God's promises about the covenant. And it was also the day of judgment against the Jews who rejected Jesus. Who had kept rejecting God for centuries before that. They're no longer his people spiritually. Now Christians are. Okay? Think of the relief they felt when they crucified Jesus. The nationalistic Jews crucified Jesus. Let's call that, you know, April, was it April 2nd, AD 33? They felt relief. They felt joy. But come Pentecost, which coincidentally would be May 23rd, AD 33, for using this year's calendar, there was a switch. God now saves through Christ, and that was the day that they no longer were his people. They remained nationalistic Jews. They still are today. But they're not viewed as the faithful, as the people of God because of that. All right. Miss Debbie, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. Was there something you were going to add or ask? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for telling. I, I apologize for... The blood and the, yeah, yeah, perhaps, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, 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 to the faithful and the unfaithful, right? Yeah, if you're a Jew and you live through that and you still reject Jesus, how hard-hearted are you, right? I mean, the curtain being torn in two from the top, talk about a sign. You know? Yes, thank you for connecting those dots. All right, so it's not airtight, okay? I'm not saying that it just adds up in every single detail perfectly. But from my perspective, that seems to answer these questions the best of the options. They face judgment through the moving on of God to, to save Christians. Right, when Noah built the ark and he entered the ark and God shut the door, that moment was a moment of judgment against all the people of the world, even before the rain fell. Who's in, who's out, judgment's coming, death is coming. Same thing happens at Pentecost. Those who reject Jesus, Jew or not, no hope, no future. All right, so we come back to this. This is what Miss Debbie mentioned earlier, but since God strengthened and preserved the faithful people until the coming of Christ. No matter which quote view you take, that's the summary. He preserved the faithful people until Christ came, so too he will preserve 
his present and future faithful people until Christ returns. We have that same promise today and so many more since Daniel to help sustain us till the end. All right, what questions do we have now? If you've got a significant question, write it down. Send me a text message. Ask me. We've got one more week. We're going to kind of try, tie up uh, kind of the big picture issues of the book of Daniel next week, Lord willing. So if you've got something we need to address, follow up on, by all means, let me know this week. And we'll try to work it in in our time together next week before we put a bow on Daniel, at least as best as we can. All right, thank you for your time, for going over a little bit tonight. I appreciate you so much.